In this video, we're going to be approximating areas under a curve using two types of Riemann sums. We're going to be using midpoint rectangles and trapezoids. So as we can see in these two examples, we can actually use the midpoint of a rectangle and get a slightly more uh, closer approximation than a left or right endpoint rectangle. If we just use the middle point, so we're going to find midpoints of our intervals and we'll use that to plug it into our function to get the value of the function at the midpoint and then multiply that by the width of our rectangle. So we'll have height times width. We'll be able to do that with midpoints. We'll also be able to do it with trapezoids. And as you can see, trapezoids are going to give us an even closer approximation because of that slant at the top not being a straight line. It's going to more closely resemble the curve. So we're going to be able to get a even more closer approximation using trapezoids. But we got to know how to find the area of a trapezoid, so we'll talk about that. First, let's talk about midpoints. So to find the height of the rectangle, which represents the value of the function at that point, we need to know our midpoint formula. So we're going to add two values and divide by two. A midpoint is like an average of two values. And then we're going to plug that midpoint value into our function, and then we'll get the function value, which is the height of the rectangle. The width of the rectangle is going to be the same as in the last video, the left and right rectangles, or left and right endpoint rectangles. It's just our change of x. So if we figure out what our interval is, we can subtract that and divide by the number of rectangles, and that'll be the width of each rectangle. So we got the width, we got the height, we can find the area of the rectangle now. Here's the summation formula of our Riemann sum. Again, not necessary to understand or to use this formula if you just understand these two concepts up here. But here's what it is. If I label each of my rectangles with a number, this is my first rectangle, second rectangle, third rectangle, and so on, then our I value here is going to represent which rectangle we're talking about. So if I'm talking about my first rectangle, I plug in 1 into I, and then I have 1 minus 1, which is 0, so I'm looking for the coordinate at x sub 0, where that would be the left endpoint. Over here, x sub i, if I'm looking at my first rectangle, that would be x sub 1, and that would be the right endpoint on my interval. So I'm just adding my two endpoints on my interval and dividing by 2. I'm finding the average of my interval there. If I plug that value into my function and evaluate it, that's the height of my rectangle at that midpoint. And then if we multiply by change of x or the width of the rectangle, then we get the area of each rectangle. And if we add up all of the areas using that summation, then we get the approximate area under the curve. Let's take a look at trapezoids. How can we find the area of trapezoids? Well, the area of a trapezoid, its formula is the average of the base lengths times the height. And as we can see here, we got to identify what the bases are. The bases are the parallel sides of a trapezoid. So the bases are running vertical, which is sometimes not normal, but just turn your head if you need to. So if we add up this base length and this base length and divide by 2, we'll find the average of the base lengths and multiply by the height. And the height is now our change of x, or the width down here of our interval. We get the area of the trapezoid. So base 1 plus base 2 divided by 2 in function notation turns into this evaluate the left endpoint of our interval and the right endpoint of our interval, add those and divide by 2. So that's what we're going to be doing to find the base length. And then we'll be able to use our change of x or the width of the interval as the height of the trapezoid and we'll multiply those two values together. And here is the summation Riemann sum formula for trapezoids. Essentially the same thing we just talked about, saying that if we add our left and right endpoints and find the average divided by 2 and multiply by the height, then we get the area of a one trapezoid 
find the area of all of our trapezoids and add it together using that summation. And we get the approximate area using trapezoids. So let's do an example. We're going to use the same function and we're going to compare the midpoint method with the trapezoidal method. We're told we want to use three midpoint rectangles or three trapezoids to approximate the area under this function on the given interval in between negative four and two. Well, in order to visualize it, which might help, we could sketch out this function. Negative x plus four is a decreasing linear function. It's got a slope of negative one and a y-intercept of four. So we can draw that function line and then sketch out some rectangles so we can visualize what areas we're trying to find here. So we're talking about the area uh, in between negative four and two on the x-axis. So if I start my first rectangle at negative four and my last rectangle is gonna end at two and we break that space up into three uh, equal rectangles. Let's figure out what the width is in case you don't know how to do that. Change of x is going to represent the width of the rectangle or the length of each subinterval. So we're breaking this interval up into three subintervals. So if I take my interval from negative 4 to 2, I subtract b minus a and divide by the number of rectangles. So b is 2, a is negative 4. Subtract those and divide by 3 because we're told we're using three midpoint rectangles. Then we find our subinterval length is two, or the width of each rectangle is two units. So if I draw my first rectangle, it goes from negative four to two. My second rectangle goes from negative two to zero. And my third rectangle goes from zero to two. So we can list those subinterval lengths. And we can use those endpoints on each subinterval to evaluate the area of each rectangle. So what we can do is we can use the long formula. We can say, I want to find the midpoint on this interval. So I need to add negative 4 and negative 2 and divide by 2. Well, that is negative 6 divided by 2, which is negative 3. Or you can just think, what is the middle value in between negative 4 and negative 2? Just think about the midpoint. So rather than evaluating it, just know that negative 3 is your midpoint, and that's what you're evaluating. It's a little shortcut you can use there. As long as you know how to find uh, a middle number in between two other numbers. So I'm evaluating my function at negative 3. That's going to represent the height of my rectangle. I'm plugging in negative 3 into this function, and I should get an output of 7. That's the height of my rectangle at the midpoint. Let's check it. If I plug in negative 3, the opposite of negative 3 is positive 3, and 3 plus 4 is 7. So my function evaluated at negative 3 is 7. It's the height of the rectangle. I'm going to multiply it by the width of the rectangle, which was 2. And I get the area of my first rectangle is 14. So I'm going to repeat that process for each of the three rectangles. And then we'll add the areas together. So the midpoint of my middle subinterval is negative 1. So if I evaluate my function at negative 1, opposite of negative 1 is 1, plus 4 is 5. So the height of my rectangle is 5. We can visualize that or verify it on the graph. And I multiply that by the width, so the area of that rectangle is 10. One more time, one more interval to do. So the midpoint in between 0 and 2 is 1. So I'm going to evaluate my function at 1. It should be 3. Let's check it. Negative 1 plus 4 is 3. So the height of the rectangle is 3, the width is 2, the area of that rectangle is 6. Add up the three areas, and the approximate area under that graph is 30. Let's compare that with the trapezoidal approximation.